Amen and amen. I just want to start off by thanking God for that because, I mean, he's so wonderful. And to really back up what my mom just prayed, because as I tell y'all all the time, there are so many occasions, and we discussed this last week uh, in our breakout session, how sometimes we, I might not have a moment to just communicate with my mom exactly what it is God gave me for tonight, but yet here God is confirming a thing. He confirmed it earlier with Granny. He confirmed it um, earlier this week with uh, my brother Broderick, and now he confirms it again with my mom. So here we go. For Bible study tonight, We have something really cool, something very near and dear to me, because this is something that God literally just brought me out of something that I'm getting results immediately, like the very next morning I got results. And what, two, three days later, here we are continually reaping results of just trusting God here. So what we'll be talking about tonight is a perceptual change or transition, whatever I name this thing, uh, or perceptual shift. There we go. Now, with the perceptual shift, we have to keep a few things in mind. One, the way you look at things is not the only way of looking at that situation, that idea, that whatever. Usually the way we view something is based upon how we've received it, how we've interacted with it. And to help us really understand what we'll be talking about tonight, we have a few definitions. So the first of which is the actual definition of what perception is. So when we take a look, perception is the ability to see, hear, or become aware of something through the senses. It's the state of being or process of becoming aware of something through our senses. When we take a look at the very bottom here, we see that in psychology, it's the neurophysiological process, including our memory, by which an organism becomes aware of and interprets external stimuli. Now, this last part is extremely important for us because... It says that it's how we process external stimuli. Here's the thing about external stimuli. It has nothing to do with our spiritual relationship that we share with God. Okay. You experience a a storm or trial in life. This is both with and without a relationship with the Lord. And we all react to it. Okay, that reaction, as we've dug in the scripture, as we'll dig in tonight, our human efforts cannot produce anything that is pleasing to God. It is only through faith that we can please God. So when we have these experiences, these different notions of what's going on, we always look at it from that knee jerk reaction perspective. Okay. Uh, you you're lacking something, you're missing something, you're missing someone, whatever the issue may be, you just quit a job, you just got a new job, you've experienced a loss or, or something has happened, whether it be good or bad. We have now garnered a perception for the thing, whatever it may be. And that perception is, as we just read, perceived through our senses. Now, if we take a look at this little diagram that I found for us to see, we can see that we go through the five senses. We have our our visual sight, our sound, our smell, our taste, our touch. And all these things, as we look to the right side of the screen, they are different sensations that stimulate our senses. And our perception involves around interpreting these senses that we have. So this is one of the biggest tactics that the enemy can use to try to trick you into thinking that new person that just ran up into your life makes you feel good. So they must be good to have around or you got this new position and now you have a lot of money or this new philosophy that you read up on in some study. They all sound and make you feel good in the moment. 
Well, we all know that these feelings of ours are they lie to us day in and day out. The Bible says that the heart is desperately wicked. Like, I, I can't make it any plainer for you. Our heart is full of wrong. But here we go. God can not only read, but he can understand the motives of our heart. When we're in the world, what we just saw about perception, that's all we have. All we have is the external, what we can touch and taste and see and hear and everything else. We only have what we can base physicality on. But and then we'll go ahead and get into scripture when it comes to the spiritual side of stimulation here. The spiritual side of perception, and me and Granny were talking about this earlier today, it's very different. So when we take a look at our Greek word for the night, which is called aesthesis, the Greek word aesthesis means perception as well. But here, when we take a look at the study of it, it is properly the brand of sense discernment, which cuts through hazy ethical or moral matters to really size things up. And we get the definition of this from Philippians chapter one, verse nine, where Paul is talking about how that he wants us. He's praying for us to keep growing, to keep maturing in love so that we can stop looking at things at base value and take what God has for us to use that to help, you know, nurture one another, to be there for one another, to build each other up in the admonition of the Lord. So now that we understand what perception is, now that we have a pretty good idea of what it looks like and how it works, now we can take a look at how to actually use godly perspective or that shift now when it comes to to everything spiritual we're not looking for something that we can taste or touch or see necessarily because we walk by faith not by sight but instead now that we've formed a a active and ongoing relationship with the lord our god now we look inwardly where god has now made his home he abides in us now because we abide in him and in this Living or in this dwelling space as abiding is defined as it is to dwell within a a certain statute. Now that we have this, we can see, you know what? It's just the thing we've been talking about. Instead of me reacting to the thing, Lord, let me give you the chance to respond to it on my behalf. And when this happens, well, things really do begin to change almost overnight. And I'll share that with you after we hop into scripture. So when it comes to our scripture, the first one that we are going to take a look at, it's a little mashup, but it's very good because it makes a lot of points necessary for us for this. So we're going to take a look at Luke chapter eight, verses 22 through 24, Mark chapter four, verses 39, back to Luke eight, the 25th verse, Matthew 8, verse 26, and then back to Mark, the 40th verse. So the Bible says, now it came to pass on a certain day and keep that certain day in mind that he got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them, let us cross over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and started out as they sailed across. Jesus settled down for a nap. But soon a fierce storm came down on the lake. The boat was filling with water and they were in real danger. The disciples went and woke him up shouting, Master, Master, we're going to drown. When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and the raging waves. Suddenly the storm stopped and all was calm. Then in Mark moving forward, when Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence or peace be still. Suddenly, the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, where is your faith? Let's keep this question in mind because he's going to ask it a few more times. The disciples were terrified and amazed. Who is this man? They asked each other. When he gives a command, even the winds and waves obey him. 
Then Jesus responded, why are you afraid? You have so little faith. Now Jesus is making a declaration about the faith here. Then he got up and rebuked the wind and waves, and suddenly there was a great calm. Then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? So, family, let's go ahead and dig into our perceptual shift here. For the past, I want to say, let's say month. It has been very hard for me to get a proper night's rest. And within this time, and maybe for the past couple of months now, it has been a true, a a true slug, like a a very sluggish fight, I'll say, to to find the the motivation to want to do almost anything. Now, it's not depression. It wasn't depression, I'll tell you that much, but it was more so like that slog that we talked about, uh, I believe a few Bible studies ago, that kind of gray area we find ourselves in, where it's like, uh, I'm in this rut, what do I do? I keep doing this and I keep doing that and I keep begging and pleading and praying and God, what's going on? That where we're the waiting process of trying to get to the next phase of life with God, it seems like it's the hardest one because usually we're going off of the last thing we've been told. But as we know, the Bible tells us that we that wait on the Lord shall renew our strength. We will mount up on wings like an eagle. We shall run and not be weary. We shall walk and not faint. Now, waiting If you've been with me before, you've heard it. But to give you a refresher, waiting is a proactive process, the same as abiding. Abiding, if we put it in one definition with one word, it means to wait. That's what abiding means. Abiding means to wait on God. It means to wait with God. It means to wait inside of God. There is a lot there. But let's apply this to the scripture here. And with the rest of the story. So we see that the disciples and Jesus are in the boat. Now, it's very important here because Jesus says, let us cross over. I made it bold because that's very important. Whenever we do anything in this life, we do it hand in hand with the Lord. That's why it's so important to highlight here that the Lord himself is telling us to let us go do this thing. He's not saying you go do it. He's saying, let us go do it. Even when Jesus was giving the disciples the great charge and he was sending them forth to go baptize the nations in his name, he did it in that same guise in his name. He didn't say go out there by yourself, do it of your own accord or your own merit, Go do it in my name, meaning go do it with me. Now that you've done your time, you've abided with me in in this phase of my journey here with you. You've waited patiently with me. You've gone through. You've hit the ups and the downs with me. Now I've brought you the promise. Here it is in its full splendor. I've gone, I've conquered death and the grave. I've took its victory, its sting. I've took all of that from it. Here I am giving you back the thing that you sold out. But this time to make sure it can never happen again, I will be the one to do it for you, with you and through you. So go forth in my name. Or if we make it a little simpler, if we transliterify it, Go forth with me. Let us cross. Let us go baptize the nations in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now that we're all caught up, Jesus in his humanness here, because he's still 100% God, but still 100% one of us. He's tired. He's been doling out left and right, healing the sick, doing all sorts of miraculous things. He's physically exhausted. He goes for a nap. Now, just like me and Granny talked about earlier today, it feels like we're going forth without feeling the Lord's presence, even though we know 
he's right there with us. We know without a shadow of a doubt, he made the promise time and time and time and time again from the Old Testament all the way on up to the end of the Bible itself and everywhere in between. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Do not be dismayed. Don't be faint of heart, but be of good cheer. Be of good heart. I'm with you. Every single time God reminds us that he's with us when it feels like because again, your feelings can lie to you. If it feels like God isn't there, I promise you he is as a student because we're the students. The teacher sometimes likes to see how you can handle a test or a situation without their direct intervention. God, who has told us in scripture that he is equipping us with everything that we need. He is making us workmen equipped to do every good work that he has already set before us to go do. So that when we go through these things in life, when we have our faith tested, it's so that our faith can be perfected. Or if we once again make it more plain to make our trust in him stronger. Stay with me here. They go through, they're in danger. They are terrified. Master, please help. The Lord wakes up. He rebukes the winds, the raging waves, the storm itself. He rebukes it. The test is over right now. All right. We see what happened. He speaks peace to the storm. The same thing he's already told them that they can do. If you have the faith of a mustard seed, it's about it's about yay big. It's probably smaller than a grain of rice and rice is very little that if we just had that much faith, we could tell the mountain itself to get up and go throw itself in the in the lake. The Lord, who is God himself, is still using an example of what good mustard seed faith looks like. He's not doing anything that's incredibly hard, not doing anything that you know, he hasn't already blessed uh, someone before to do, you know, um, who was it? It was Elisha. He prayed that there would be a drought and there was a drought for, I believe, 10 or so years, maybe more, maybe less. Don't quote me here. But the point is, there was a very long drought, all because he had faith that he could do it. He had faith in God that when God would hear his prayer, he would call, he would let it be. When he got the mantle from Elijah, he said, Lord, if you have really passed on the, the blessing to me, there was a little pond of water. He said, well, then part this water and it parted. He had the faith that it would happen. We come back now to the Lord himself. He's showing what the faith can do. And it, it happened. It stopped. Now they're terrified and amazed. What kind of man is this that even the nature itself obeys him? But then he poses the question, where is your faith? Well, my brothers and sisters, this one might sting a little bit. But when we go through certain things, where is our faith? Where is our trust? Let me tell you. Again, past month few months. It's been a slog. It has been a bloody bare knuckle fist fight. The other day, Wednesday to be exact, I was sitting right here at my desk about to go get in the shower and the Lord just stopped me. Call your brother. Didn't say who, but he didn't. He didn't need to specify which one I knew who to call. Picked up my phone. I called him. Turns out me and my boy have been going through the exact same struggle exact same didn't know it couldn't tell but exact same thing we begin to discuss what was going on in one another's lives not to bore you with details and then we came to the conclusion that you know what it's not that there is something necessarily stopping us there's just a whole lot of complaints here there's a whole lot of I don't feel like it or this has made me feel a certain way but the question is why God has given us literal everlasting life while we're here waiting to receive the, the promise of it. We just got a little work to do. Just a little bit, you know, even if we live 100, 
20 years, the max lifespan God has given us, that's a short amount of time compared to eternity with him. So as we came to this agreement, it wasn't a pity party, but more so of two blades of iron coming to sharpen one another. We begin to to preach to one another, reminding each other of scripture of what the Lord has to say. And then a plan was made. As I told Granny earlier today, the Bible teaches us that the wise man or the wise person is one that numbers their steps unto the Lord. Normally, for the past, I want to say five years now, I would normally uh, begin to read scripture at night before bed. And in the morning, I'd read like the verse of the day. Now, I know as adults, this may sound crazy, but for the, the past, again, month or two, haven't had any necessarily an, an alarm set to just get up in the morning. I just get up when I got up and then I would begin the day work, whatever it was. I just go do it then. It was a slug. It was it was a slug fest. OK, but I'm, I'm being being transparent with you to help get this point across. Then we'll dissect the rest of the scripture and move on. I said, you know what, God, I want to make this. I want to I want our, our relationship to go to the next level. So I, I set a few alarms eight o'clock. Nothing too crazy. You know, I, I got up Thursday morning. I read the word. I prayed. I got up. I started my day. I noticed I wasn't tired after I woke up. I noticed that I, I was feeling kind of peppy. I had some energy I forgot that I had access to. I was like, OK, this is nice. This morning I woke up. I read the scripture. I prayed. I began to do um, a Sudoku puzzle a little later. And once again, I noticed, Lord, I feel really peppy and full of energy. And as even the night before and earlier this morning, <clears throat> something just wouldn't let me go. And I know it was the Lord. And then we'll dissect this and move on. But what happened is, and it, Granny said it so perfectly, God through her. It's that what happened was, is that I shifted. I began to stop worrying about the meaningless things that we talk about all the time here because the struggles we deal with while yes they are valid yes they are apparent because they're right in front of us and they are a constant nag but God's grace is sufficient for every single thing that we go through don't know what Paul was going through when he was asking God to remove the thorn from his side but every single time God answered back my grace is sufficient for you because in your weakness my strength is made perfect well in order for God's strength to be made perfect in the weakness the first thing we need to do is acknowledge that we're weak the first thing we need to do is acknowledge God and say Lord I'm available to you the same way that the the man who brought his his son to be healed from the demon that would throw him to and fro to Jesus that when he came to the Lord and said, your disciples prayed, but nothing could happen. He was like, oh, y'all have such just little faith or where is the faith? Why don't you have any faith? You've been with me for so long. Why don't you trust me yet? The man said, Lord, if you would, and if you are capable of, please heal him. Jesus, well, what do you mean if I'm capable? I'm more than capable. And yeah, I will do it because then he saw the onlookers and they were Wondering, well, can he do it? Is he who he says he is to be? And he cast out the demon. But what the man said is what we should all be praying when we get to these moments like I was in. Lord, I believe, but please help me with my unbelief. Help shift me to where I need to go. I know I've been waiting and I know at times after waiting for a while, it seems a little meaningless because 
what's changing? What has changed? Where has the light at the end of the tunnel gone? But let me remind you right now that in the same way Jesus was right there with the disciples, in the same way he's with you and me right now, wherever we go on this planet and in the life to come, we'll be right there with them. He has not gone anywhere. He has not broken his promise. The promise that he would never leave us nor forsake us. The promise that he would never abandon us like an orphan, but the promise that he would be with us always low, as the King James says, I will be with you even until the end of the age or the world as we make it plain, meaning that whatever you struggle with, you are struggling with, God is right there. Some st- some storms, some trials, some tests are exactly that a test to see where your trust is with God. Can you trust me? If I don't promise to bring you the resources on the date you think you need the resources, I don't care if the bill says it's past due. Don't you trust me to still give you more than enough to cover the the overage, the overages? Don't you trust me that even if this deal you thought was perfect doesn't go through, that I can make something even better for you? Because when you sold yourself out in the garden, yes, we all sold ourselves out that I came, I made you a promise, and that not only did I deliver that promise, but I gave you a way to be sold out now. Not sold out, but sold out. We now belong to Christ the Lord, the one who made a way out of no way, who in the midst of the storm never left the situation, but wanted to see how we would respond to it, not react, but how we would respond to the situation. Would we be frightful? Would we be anxious? Would we be nervous? Or would we say, I've seen this before? Lord, Right now, I need strength. Lord, give me the courage to keep pushing forward. Lord, I don't know what's going to happen, but I trust you because you've never not once given me a reason not to do so. So let's go forward. Let's you and me go forward, God, in Jesus' own words. Let us cross over to your blessing. Let us cross over to your breakthrough. Let us continue to grow together. Because that's my job as your father, as your Lord, as your king to protect you, to guide you, to love you, to keep you and to keep pushing you forward. Jesus says, why are you afraid? You have so little faith. We go through things. We doubt a little bit. Why is our faith so small that we forget that God who made the impossible possible is literally the God of all possibilities? When they asked the disciples, asked Jesus, who could go to heaven? He said, humanly speaking, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So why is our faith so little? Then he goes on and wraps it up in Mark saying, do you still have no faith? Do we really want our father to ask us after all we've been through with him, all we've gone through to ask us, do we not have any faith? Well, let me tell you the alternative to this. When we take a look at John chapter 6, verses 16 through 21, Jesus has a different tune for us. The Bible says that evening, Jesus's disciples went down to the shore to wait for him, but darkness fell and Jesus still hadn't come back. They, here's the stark difference here. Jesus before said, let us The disciples went off on their own. They got into the boat and headed across the lake toward Capernaum. Soon a gale swept down upon them and the sea grew very rough. They had rowed three or four miles when suddenly they saw Jesus walking on the water toward the boat. They were terrified, but he called out to them, don't be afraid. I am here. We know what I am means. That's the other name for God or Yahweh, his eternal covenant name. So Jesus is saying, don't be afraid. God, or to make it more personal, your God is right here. Then they were eager to let him in the boat and immediately they arrived at their destination. Hmm. Something happened here. We see in the King James, it says, it is I, be not afraid, but in the Amplified, it is I, or I am. Once again, Yahweh, do not be afraid. 
what happened here? They embarked upon a journey on their own. And almost instantly, they started running into trials and tribulations and different things. But when they saw the Lord, who was never far to begin with, if we use our imagination, he probably just had himself hidden for a moment to see how long they would wait, how they would respond instead of react to the situation. And when they were in trouble, just like the good father he is, even when he bawled them out a little bit about their faith, he never left them. He said, do not be afraid. Your God is right here. And what happens when God makes his presence unmistakably known to us? We stop focusing on the tiny little issue in front of us. And instead, we shift our gaze from it to almighty God, who is bigger than anything that we can ever go through. And what happens when we shift our focus from this little thing that cannot even begin to bother us to the Lord himself. We arrive exactly where we need to be immediately. Once I set this little schedule for myself, I prayed about it too. Woke up Thursday morning and this morning and things were different. The slog no longer felt like a fight. The ceaseless endless meaninglessness all desisted and well what is it cease and desist it, it 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 just began to eradicate itself god said see what happens when you stop worrying and stop focusing on the problem as if you can do anything about it and instead you focus on me the one you have relationship with the one who makes ways out of no ways the one who has supplied your every need and continues to do so until the day he takes us on home the one who has an answer to our prayers before we even have a prayer that needs to be prayed the one who knows our thoughts even when they're far from us the one who knows the secret motives of our hearts that is desperately as we want to please our heavenly father sometimes we just can't because of this human condition of ours, but he holds none of that against us. Instead, he wants to remind you, don't be afraid. Don't be anxious. Don't be worried. Don't be upset. I'm right here with you. Your God is here in the midst of it all. I'm right here. I've never left you. I never will. I won't forsake you. I never will. I'm right here. And I want to remind you, brothers and sisters, how good God is that, yes, some things that we come out of, it takes a bit to fully walk out of it. But that's only because it's to help grab a few people along the way that are going through the same thing. Other things are instantaneous where you pray, you trust God, you let go, let him have it and be available to him. Lord, I just need you to be God. That's all I need. I need you to step in and do your thing because clearly I was trying to drive and I, I don't know how to drive that well. So father, please, in your capable hands, you, you do the, you have the honor. And what happens? We get there instantly. We kept making left turns. Don't you know if, if you keep making left turns or keep making right turns, you'll just go in a circle. But God says, baby, all you had to do was keep following the street called straight. I put you on it. I'm the guide. I'm the one that's the gate. I'm the door. I'm giving you free clearance to have pasture to go in and out freely. And that freeness is so that you can go come back, get your rest, leave, go help a few people out, come back, re up and go out again to keep coming and going so that as we leave, we leave refreshed as we come back to get more refreshments. We have a few people to bring on and we have a few problems that we can leave at the altar. We have a few issues that we can just work out with God. We have some things that we can just shift away from. It's so easy, but yet we make things so hard. I don't know why it's the human condition, but let me tell you, as the one God has blessed to give you these lessons, I don't know how the past few, aside from tonight, have been so blessed aside that he is good. Because, baby, I promise you, I wasn't here. But as my mom said, we serve notice on the enemy. We have prayer. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, 
but they are spiritual in nature that have the power to reign in every vile imagination to destroy strongholds and my favorite one to take anything that would try to keep you from the truth of who God is and to just blow it up because nothing in all of creation once you get saved can separate you from God's love not on the earth not above it not below it nothing in all of existence and existence is pretty vast but yet very tiny since it all rests in his capable hands that can separate you from his love. So what makes you think that the enemy who has a a few little tricks can get one over on you for good? He cannot at best. The enemy can slow you down. He can, uh, what is it? Jack's that, that game with the ball and a little weird, shape spear thingies i don't really know how to describe them better than that but i know they're jacks he'll throw a few in the in the road he'll throw a few spurs there to try to get underneath your feet but also don't forget whatever distractions because that's all he has to offer he tries to send your way all they can do is stimulate your physical senses but god who is eternal not finite but eternal can stimulate your spiritual senses who in the midst of the storm where you should be depressed face first on the ground tears streaming down your face can proudly stand up and say but God I know you got me I know you'll get me through who can walk in the middle of the storm because now he's formed you an eye or a place to rest in though the storm is still raging and out of control God has now Like we've talked about before, he's not taking you around the storm to subvert it, but he's taking you straight through to show you that when you just trust him, no matter how crazy or how bad it looks, you're okay. Now, as we further look in the scripture, we have an oldie, but a goodie. We take a look at Proverbs here. So when we look at this, we take a look at Proverbs chapter one, verse seven, Proverbs three, five through six, and then chapter three, a little further down, verses 13 through 18. The Bible tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, or as the NLT says, it's the beginning of true knowledge. The stuff we get down here, that's cool and all. It might help you make a buck or two. But the real knowledge, the stuff that's going to stick with you all comes from God. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. It continues to say that if we just trust in the Lord with all our heart and we do not depend on our own understanding, well, then we'd be okay. If we seek his will in all that we do, he will show us which path to take. Again, God letting you know, let us go do the thing. I'm not telling you to go do it on your own, but let me and you Let's let's go do it together. Let's go have a family outing. You need to grow. I already got the car packed and I got your overnight bag. Let's go hit the road. You need a blessing. Well, I'm so glad you came to me. I was already preparing to give you something. But now that you've reminded me of my own word, I want to give it to you right now. Continuing, it says joyful is the person who finds wisdom, the one who gains understanding for wisdom is more profitable than silver and her wages are better than gold. Wisdom is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. She offers you long life in her right hand and riches and honor in her left. She will guide you down delightful paths. All her ways are satisfying. Wisdom is a tree of life to those who embrace her. Happy are those who hold her tightly. Now, one of my favorite things about Proverbs, aside from it being the book of wisdom, are all the wonderful nuggets of scripture that we have in here. We've covered, what is it, uh, Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, so much in the past two years that we've been having Bible study together. But let me refresh you once more. Trust in the Lord with the peace of your heart. That doesn't sound right. With some of it, nah, it says all your heart. Meaning, just like the man who had the son that was demon possessed, 
if you sense or even feel that you may not be able to trust God on something, well, baby, you have some unbelief, but it's okay. It comes with this subscription of ours to this human condition. It's all right, though. God has given us a way to overcome it. It's him. He's the way, the truth, the life, the light. He's all in all. He's everything we need to beat this thing. So when we trust in him, when we come to the impasses where we see we may not have let him in just yet, Father, help me with my unbelief. Help me with the disbelief in this area. Remind me that even though I'm acting just a little bit crazy right now, that you've brought me from way back there to way over here. And now the sins that used to be in the middle are as far from me as the east is to the west, meaning they can never touch me ever again. They could pass right by each other, but because east and west never meet, they'll never touch me ever again. But your love will cover me always. So when we don't depend on our own understanding, that means that we can depend on God's complete and perfect knowledge and wisdom. And when we seek his will in all that we do, even if it's just getting up in the morning, if it's just reading your scripture at a different time of day, praying at a different time of day or in a different manner, doing one extra little thing just to show God that you're trying your best. Well, what happens? He'll show you exactly what you need to do, the path you need to take. And that path or that plan is already pre-prepared for you. It's a plan for good and not for evil, a plan to prosper you, to give you a hope, a future and an expected end. I can't make it any simpler for you, but just know God has you. All you have to do is allow him to have you. And this wisdom that we get from just spending time with God, from saying I'm available, feed me, teach me, I'm thirsty, please give me some of your water, Father. Well, don't you know he'll do it? The Bible tells us that anyone who asks the Lord for wisdom is never turned down. Anyone who earnestly cries out to the Lord is never rejected, but that anyone who has that meek and lowly and contrite heart cries out to him. We're heard, we're seen, we're validated, we're given exactly what we need because that's the kind of God that Jesus is. He's not some statue sitting there that we need to polish. He's not interested in a house like this made out of wood and sheetrock and bricks and whatever else you have holding your house together. He's interested in a little place called your heart. And if you just give it to him, he's not asking for a lot from you, I promise you. Then just watch what he does. He turned something I was struggling with for months. He turned it around within however long it took me to close my eyes Wednesday night and wake up Thursday morning in his splendor. Just trust him. I'm, I'm telling you, it, it pays off. Now to take us home and probably one of my favorite scriptures, one of my grandmother's favorite scriptures, one of my mom's, my aunt's, probably everybody in here, one of our favorite scriptures. We take a look at Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, and then First John, John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. And the Bible says, and so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable, not you, but that he finds acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind and ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Then the Bible says that do not love this world nor the things it offers you, meaning the things that can please your senses, your physical senses. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure. See, the Bible even says it. A craving for everything we see and pride in our achievements and possessions, the stuff that breaks and we got to replace because nothing's built worth a dime anymore. 
These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away, along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. Or, as the King James Version of the Bible says, he who does the will of God abides forever. Well, 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 there's that magical word again, abides. So let's recap. Let's let's walk ourselves back through this. First, starting off with Romans chapter 12, the Bible, as the NLT says, to be not conformed to this world, but instead to be transformed into a new person by allowing God to reshape the way we think or our perception of things. Let God shift you out of a worldly way of thinking and into a spiritual way of thinking. Do you have problems? Be of good cheer. Pray about it. Don't be anxious about the situation. Stop reacting to everything. Instead, in gratefulness and thanksgiving, as Philippians tells us, pray about everything. And when you do, God will give you a peace which surpasses all of your understanding. And then, my dear brothers and sisters, when you meditate and focus your heart and your mind on those things that are good and just and true and pure and holy, the God of peace himself, who was there from the beginning, will be right there with you in the midst of a storm, which translates to he'll make his presence known to you. Why? Because you're reminding him of his own word. Father, you told me if I have a need to just pray about it. You told me out of your own mouth that you were taking the middle man away and instead I could pray directly to you now. I don't have to go through some priest in a temple, but instead, because you are my priest, In the greatest temple of all, your throne room. Now, there's no middleman. I talk to you directly. I pray to you with your name. And then I end it again in your name. Heavenly Father, Lord, Jesus, whatever you use to start the prayer, you've acknowledged God. In Jesus' name. Once again, you said his great name to to solidify the deal. Then you stamped it by saying amen, which again, in the book of Revelation, he is the yes and the amen. You've acknowledged him in all of his ways by doing that. But we see that when we just focus on God's love and not so much the issues that we deal with, when we shift away from the the nuisances that tend to deal with us and instead focus more so on his grace which is sufficient for us and if we translate God's sufficiency and weigh it against our definition of sufficiency sufficiency for us mean it's just barely enough we just got by but God's sufficiency which is well way over here and makes ours kind of just fly out of meaning God's sufficiency means to surpass excellence excellently. I can't make it up. I mean, it's uh, I believe it's the the Greek translation of it. But the point is, is that God is so good in all that we go through, all that we deal with, all that we struggle with to where it just makes it all seem like it never even existed in the first place. In the same way, the disciples who saw the Lord beckoning them, don't be afraid. Your God is right here. I'm with you, baby. Don't worry about it. Focus on me. Just look at me. You arrive. You break through. You get the blessing. You walk out of it. You forget it even happened. You let the past go because the past, once again, cannot hurt you. It just stinks. So let it stink away from you, please. Instead, focus on today. How can you take today and make God proud of you? Can you pray for somebody you might not have prayed for in a while? Can you just check up on that one person who you know has been going through it, but you wanted to give them a little space? Don't worry about that. Ask them how they're doing. Make someone laugh. Whatever God places on your heart, do it. And then as far as the future goes, like the Bible tells us, number those steps. Say, Lord, if you grant me tomorrow, because tomorrow is not promised, I would like to do this in your name. I would like to do this for the kingdom. I would like to get this going for my brothers and sisters. 
Because when we do that, well, God is so happy. He's already pleased with you because the stamp of his son is on your life. But then he gets extra happy because now you're trying to take the power that he's given you and you're trying to use it to go do some godly good, not human good, which means uh, you owe me one, but godly good, which says I did it not because we necessarily deserve it, but because this is what God would want, because he wants his love to abound, meaning he wants it to go out, open up flourish, reflect onto some hearts and get them saved. So with that, my brothers and sisters, I simply remind you when you struggle with something, when you go through some things, when you feel like you're in that gray area, ask yourself before the Lord has to ask you, where is my trust? Where is it? Where is it exactly? Is it in the money in my bank account, which could disappear overnight? Is it in the things that I've amassed because God has been good to me that could burn up in a freak accident? Or is it in him, the one who, regardless if I lost everything right now, would still have me? If I'm broke with stuff, then I would be rich in him regardless to where if I had lived the rest of my life with not a penny to my name, I know for sure when I get to heaven, I'm going to be balling. Heavenly Father. We thank you so much for literally everything you do, because it's in these instances just like this, Lord, that you remind us of how awesome you are, that you can take weeks, months, years of our lives that we've been in turmoil and you can turn it over just like that, God. You can make those bad years turn into a a nightmare overnight, because just like the word says, pain, suffering, it endures, but for that night, but your joy, Lord, comes in the morning. And I thank you that we abide in the morning because you're the great and morning star, Lord. So father, if there's someone who's heard this message that you've blessed us with, that is struggling, that's going through, that is still looking at that situation from the same old dirty angle, will God just shift them, nudge them over just an inch or two to the right and let them see, wow, you mean to tell me I could have been come out of this? And all you'll do is say, yes, baby. Now let's continue to cross over together because this isn't a solo act. Once you became our God, once we accepted you as Lord and Savior, we haven't been alone since that day. And Father, for that, we truly say thank you because as a human being, the biggest fear of ours is to be alone. But now we don't have to worry about that ever again because we have you, O sovereign Lord. And then you even blessed us to have a family, a multitude, a remnant that we belong to that we can call home. And that not only do we have a home, a temporary one here, one that we can find rest in amongst each other. But Lord, we have a permanent one with you that when our personal mansion is ready, as you said, that you would come and get us and bring us to where you are, God. And that's exactly where we want to be, whether it's here or there. We want to be where you are, Father. So, Lord, if you'd be so kind as to just remind us that your presence has never left us, then I'm pretty sure we'd find the courage to break free and keep pushing forward, to pray just that much more, to read just that much more, to suffer with you just that much more, because it only takes this much from us, God. One percent of effort while you do the ninety nine point nine percent rest of it for us. Father, we love you so much. We thank you for all the things that you bless us with, for all the things that you bring to our attention and for everything that you make clear and apparent so that we can bring it to you and begin to grow. God, we will be sure to give your name all the praise, all the honor and all the glory which you so rightly deserve. It's these things we thank you for. In Jesus name we pray. Amen and amen. Hello, beloved, and thank you so much for stopping by today. It's my prayer that you received something truly beautiful out of today's message, whether it's to keep pressing toward that glorious standard that God has for our lives, or if you aren't a part of the family to come and join us as we celebrate the new life that Jesus has given us. Heavenly Father, we come before you in prayer saying, thank you, Lord. Thank you that despite all that's going on in the world, that you are 
God and you will always be God. We thank you for the sacrifice that your darling son Jesus paid for on that cross called Calvary, Lord. We thank you that now through the shedding of blood, there is a remission for sins and we have a true path to eternal life, God. I pray that all those under the sound of my voice would either be encouraged to keep pressing towards your throne room, God, to receive grace and mercy or to come and join the family so that they can shed off the old and embrace the new. It's these things we thank you for as you continually lead us down the paths of righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, thank you so much for stopping by. Please don't forget to like, to comment, and to subscribe. As we move forward, remember new content coming at you every Saturday, and it's our prayer that you would be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen.